And a very pleasant good day to one and all. I'm Brother James, and I greet you one more time. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And I welcome all of you to the Preaching of the Cross radio broadcast. This program is a ministry of the Bible Baptist Church in Deland, Florida, heard on this radio station and seen on this particular internet site. By the grace of God and through the prayerful help of His people, it is my great honor to be able to speak to you from the pages of the Holy Bible. It's my great honor to be able to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of my soul. I trust the Savior of your soul, the the keeper of my life. I trust the keeper of your life and the one that gave us this pure and perfect holy Bible, this, this blessed treasure that is ours, God's Word in our language. What an incredible thing. We are inching our way toward a passage in James chapter number two, which has been disputed and argued about for many, many centuries, but we're not quite there yet. We're we're almost, almost there, but not quite. We're still discussing how saved people should treat saved people who visit their churches and unsaved people who visit their churches. And the Bible told us in this uh, pr- the prior passage, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. That's James chapter 2 and verse number 8. And we were told in James 1.25, if we keep this royal law, this law of liberty, we will be blessed in our deeds. And we continue now in with verses 12 through 16, and, and we'll just uh, put our toe into the water of verse 17 today. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Our context which is demanded, our context, which is absolutely essential if we're going to understand the truth, takes us back to verse number one. Everyone who is saved, everyone who attends or visits a church, is not in the same situation or circumstance in life as regards temporal or material things. Now, Everyone who is saved is equally saved. Everyone who is saved is is indwelt and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, that they are gifted by uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Ephesians uh, four and and other places. But everyone who gets saved doesn't automatically earn the same income as everyone else who is saved. Everyone who is saved doesn't automatically get moved into a home. Uh, of equal value and size as everyone else who is saved. And so there are people who will come into our assemblies wearing very nice clothing and able to afford jewelry and adornments, and others who will come into our assembly that are that are not doing so well. Also, again, I, I've got to keep reminding you, the recipients of this letter were impoverished because of their faith. They were not made wealthy because of their faith. They were made poor because of their faith. And if you recall from the book of Acts and from reading several of Paul's letters, and we won't run the references today, some churches were were on a regular basis taking up offerings to deliver to other churches because people in one part of the world who were saved had enough money for themselves and for others, 
and people in, in differing parts of the world who were saved didn't have enough money to buy food and clothing. So the Bible makes us equal in spiritual matters, but it certainly does not make us equal in temporal matters. Now, what we're called upon to do is not treat some Christians well and other Christians badly. We're called upon to love our neighbor as ourself, not our rich neighbor or poor neighbor, but, but love our neighbor as ourself, and we'll be blessed if we do so. And then comes verse number 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So here's the first fact. Everyone who is saved has been freed from condemnation. Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, walk not of flesh, but have the Spirit. Thank the Lord for that. However, it is still true, it is still true that it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. It is also true of saved people that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10. And then it is also true that the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give out rewards to his people in a day of judgment, according to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 8. So this idea that I am saved, therefore I will never be judged, that's not true. Everyone is going to be judged by the Lord, and those judgments will be based upon or in accord with our works lined up against the Word of God. Now, there is nothing, there is nothing in the passage about the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5 that would lead anyone to believe that what is being judged there is whether or not someone is saved. There is nothing in the passage on the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3 or Romans 14 that would lead anyone to believe that judgment is to determine whether or not someone is saved. Those, those judgments are of saved people to determine their reward or loss of such. And it's clear from those passages, and we're not going to read them today. You can read them for yourself. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 3, Romans chapter 14. However, however, the judgment here certainly seems to be others' judgment of our lives, not God's judgment of our soul or even of our lives. Now, let, let's read it together and, and see, see if you will agree or disagree. In verse number 12, so speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment, present tense, without mercy, that hath showed no mercy. There is a similar passage. I'm going to, going to hope that I can turn right to it. There's a similar passage in Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Now, hear what I'm saying. If we must stand at the judgment seat of Christ, if our deeds must be judged, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 3, if it is appointed unto men once to die after this the judgment, then we must be judged. If you're not saved or if you're born before after the church age, uh, there's the white throne judgment, the dead, small, and great standing before that throne. Listen, if God says, judge not that he be not judged, then there must be a judgment, a receiving of judgment that can be avoided. And it's not the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not the judgment that comes after death. Judge not that he be not judged for with what judgment ye judge, 
ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, it can't be wrong for to say a man is drunk when we see him obviously drunken. It is wrong to say why the man is drunk when we don't have that information. We've gone too far. So consider this. I am a saved man. I hope you're saved. I'm saved. I trusted Jesus Christ, my Savior, December 17, 1976. I'm saved from that day forward throughout all eternity because the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and he gives me eternal life and I shall never perish. I have everlasting life. Nevertheless, if I mistreat you when you come to church because you are poor and I make you my footstool or or regard you as someone that I should put my feet upon, you are not worthy to stand by my side. You are not worthy to, to sit next to me. You should be my footstool. I am, I am going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ one day after I die, and that, that will be taken into consideration. However, however, in the context of James 1 and 2, if I love my neighbor as myself, I am blessed in my deed, that's present tense, If I mistreat my neighbor, I am judged without mercy, James 2, 13. That's that's present tense. And in Matthew chapter 7, I am told that people are going to treat me the way or in accord with the way that I treat them. Keep reading in the context of, of Matthew 7, verse 3. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly, or shalt thou see clearly, to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So my brother has a, he has a mote in his eye. I'm not wrong about that. But if I'm, overly concerned with the moat in his eye and and ignoring the beam in my own eye, my judgment is incorrect, and who is going to be affected initially by my incorrect judgment? That that would be my brother. I am I am mistreating my brother because I'm I'm judging him without judging myself. Now, who's the second immediate, immediate person to suffer consequences when I don't judge properly or don't treat my brother properly? That would be me. That man is looking back at me, though he's having trouble with one of his eyes because it's got a, a splinter in it, but he's looking back at me with his one good eye and he's saying, are you kidding me? You got a two by four sticking out of your face and you're telling me I need help? And then all of his friends and all of my friends and the other people. Look, I've got a church full of people who are watching me and saying, what is he doing? Why is he unloading on that guy for that little problem in his life when he's got such a big, huge problem in his own life? What happens? I become the recipient of the judgment I am meeting out precisely because I am meeting out that judgment. Now suppose, come back to James 2, verse number 13, mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Suppose, suppose I approached the man with the splinter in his eye, and I said, uh, I said, man, listen, uh, we all got problems, but right now I seem to have the bigger problem. Could you help me? Could you help me with this beam that I got sticking out of my eye? It's, it's clouding my vision. It's, pre- it's preventing me from seeing things clearly. I just need some help. Can you help me? Do you not suppose 
that after that man put his foot on my shoulder and grabbed that beam and yanked it out of my eye, that he might be more inclined to say, hey, by the way, Paola, I got something right here in my eye. Now that we got your eyes fixed, you think you could help me with this? Do, do you not suppose, and it's not supposition, it's Bible, do you not suppose that if I were to treat all people with mercy, I would be likely, more likely, to receive from them merciful treatment rather than judgmental treatment? And would you not agree that if I treat others uh, with harsh judgment, it's more, more likely that they will respond and treat me with harsh judgment. Is that, that's, that's what the Bible teaches in the book of James and in the book of Matthew in particular. Now, in this context, in this setting, these verses, what doth it profit my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? You haven't read anything you haven't read anything since James chapter 1, verse 2, about a lost person getting saved. You haven't read anything. We haven't read anything since James chapter 1, verse 2, about someone who is not a believer coming to Christ for salvation. So from what then are we being saved? in verse number 14. You, well, preacher, saved means saved. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Men in the Bible have been saved from, saved from starvation. Men of the Bible have been saved from drowning. Men of the Bible have been saved from their fears. Men of the Bible have been saved from enemy armies. There's a lot of things to be saved from in the Bible besides hellfire. The Bible says in Matthew 24, there's coming a time of great tribulation when most of the people in the world will die. But if you live to the end of that thing, you'll be saved. From what? Dying during that tribulation. We can't run all those verses today. We're not going to. Now, what are we dealing with in James 2, verses 1 through 16? We're dealing with people who have needs and people who have the means whereby to meet those needs, but who will, not, who will not meet the needs of others because they consider themselves superior and consider it beneath their dignity to condescend to these lower materially, lower in possessions, lower in opportunities, brothers and sisters in Christ. So you say, you say, you have faith. Come on, come on now. Look in verse number one. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. You say you have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is merciful. Our Lord Jesus Christ helps people. Our Lord Jesus Christ welcomes the least into his church. Will you? Will you welcome the least? Will you be merciful? Will you be kind? Will you be gracious? What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? This is a remarkable statement. He's not discussing someone who is lost needing to be born again. He's not, he's not discussing someone who claims to be saved needing the genuine article, needing to really truly be saved. Look at verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked, not only do they not have vile raiment, they don't even have decent raiment, enough to cover themselves on a regular basis, or, and, destitute of daily food. Here's people who are truly starving. 
though they are attending our assembly. And one of you say to them, depart in peace, be you warmed and filled. <laughs> Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? So you say you have faith, and you say to a hungry man, God bless you, I hope you find some food out there somewhere, and you go home and eat twice the food you need and store the leftovers for the next day, the Lord said, you, you, don't have, you don't have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say you weren't saved. He didn't say that. We're not even talking about being saved. Let me ask you something. When the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. When the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, why would you, verse 3, why would you treat a man with a gold ring very, very well when he came into your assembly and not treat the man without the gold ring the same way? Because you think, this is the only reason you would do this, because you think it would be to your advantage to treat the wealthy man well, and there would be no advantage to you in treating the poor man well. If, if someone came into your church with really nice clothes and another man came in with not so nice clothes, why would you think it would be to your advantage to treat the man with the nice clothing better because you see that as being advantageous to you or your cause or, or you as a, the minister, he might give big offerings or your church might, he might have the, the money that you need for certain projects and things. And yet, Look at verse number 14. What doth it profit, my brethren? Do you see what God said? A church, a real church, God's church, doesn't profit by cultivating wealthy people. It doesn't profit by seeking money from people that it perceives have money to give. What is profitable to an assembly of believers is treating people the way Jesus Christ wants people treated. There's the profit. You say, here's what we're going to do. We, 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 we want to put up a big building, and we want to do this for missions, and we want to get a vehicle, and we want to take on a couple of staff people and we want, our, we want to give our pastor a raise, let's go get some money people into this church, and then we'll have money. And you know what the Lord said? That's a zero-profit approach to Christianity. That's what he said. However, if you will have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and be merciful, and help people who can't help you, and be a blessing to people who can't be a blessing to you, and do for people who can't do anything for you in return, God, God will see to it that you and your assembly is profitable. How about that? I'll tell you, the, the, when, when the Spirit of the Living God wrote this book, Every word that he chose was the right word. And, and every way that he saw fit to phrase something was the very way it should have been phrased. It's an amazing book, this Bible. In 1 John chapter 4, oh, I've got to hurry. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 17, the scripture says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, that's a, a, taking the James passage and going in a different direction. The first John passage looks beyond the immediate and looks to the coming day of judgment. In Job 22, Job 22 and verse number 6, 
Job 22.6. Uh, here we have a question in verse number two. Can a man be profitable unto God? as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself. Now you see that? There's the profit again. What doth it profit? Can you be profitable to God? Probably not. Can you be profitable unto yourself? Quite possible. Verse 3, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous, or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? God's not any better off if you live right, but you will be. Will he reprove thee for fear of thee? Will he enter with thee into judgment? Is not thy wickedness great and thine iniquities infinite? For thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught and stripped the naked of their clothing. Thou hast not given water to the weary to drink, and thou hast withholden bread from the hungry. You see that? The Lord said, I'll tell you what, you can't, you can't, Profit me. But but you can profit you. If you're righteous, it doesn't help me. God, God, God says, it doesn't help me. I'm, I'm, I'm no more God if you're righteous. But if you're righteous, your life will be better. Okay, God, where do I start? Stop saying who can give me a drink and give people a drink. Stop saying, who can give me something to eat, and give people something to eat. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. When God was manifest in the flesh, that's what he did. And he wants us to follow in his steps and live like him, and not just say that we have faith, but walk by faith in his word, following him living as he would have us to live, and being a blessing not just to our favorites in the church, but to everyone in the church. And not giving extra to the people who don't need anything, but giving extra to the people who have great need. And that's what this passage in James chapter 2 is all about. Well, I've used up almost every bit of time that I have today. Our, our web address, jameswnox.org jameswnox.org, and everything that I would tell you if I had more time to tell you, you can figure out right there on that website. The announcer will be on in just a moment to let you know when this program will be heard again over this radio station, and we hope that at that time, you and a friend that you invite to listen with you will join us for the Preaching of the Cross radio broadcast. Until then, I'm Brother James. May the Lord richly bless you, and good day.